Warning, the following video contains explicit language which may be offensive to some viewers or inappropriate for children. The content within this video is intended for mature audiences only. Science fiction, the great teacher, the great inspiration. It helps us see the endless possibilities of life. So let's be inspired together. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over that way, what's beyond our own shores. Okay, so, you know, I want to uh, go into the Easter eggs <laughs> of the uh, of the show. And, and I had to write a lot of it down because there was so many uh, things that they had in here. So what I did is I just picked the ones that I thought were like trivia, uh, like trivia questions or something. You know, I didn't, I mean, the obvious ones were there. I mean, you could see, you know, like this fleet museum, you saw the bounty and the uh, Kronos One and uh, the uh, the uh, a Constitution class starship. You know those were obvious. I mean anybody that has any passing familiarity with Star Trek would even know that. So I took the ones that weren't so obvious that might have slipped by uh, while you were watching it uh, because. You know, if you were watching it for the first time, you're not going to really pay that close attention to it unless you rewatch it and rewatch it and re you know, <laughs> you know. But what I did is I just, as I was watching it, I was already, I was already aware that they were putting Easter eggs in there uh, from the comments I saw. So I, uh, uh, as I was watching it, I kind of wrote down what I saw, and out of that list, I just picked the ones that I thought would be interesting to uh, to uh, talk about. So let's start here. <clears throat> uh, when the show starts, uh, they have that uh, where it says in the 25th century uh, in the same font as they used in Star Trek II when they say in the 23rd century. I mean, I, I recognize that. And I imagine a lot of you people who've watched Star, uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, like 500,000 times in your life probably recognize that right off just as I did. So... <laughs> um, so while we were going through uh, the Elios here, uh, Dr. Crusher's ship, um, <clears throat> and I'm not even really sure if it was her ship or just something she was borrowing, I don't know. Right? <laughs> it just seemed to me like it wasn't a civilian ship, you know, that I could tell. Anyway, uh, we were panning through inside the darkened ship like everything else, um, and you could hear Captain Picard's uh, log entry from uh, best of both worlds where the Enterprise was hiding in the nebula and Picard was giving a log entry on you know what his thoughts were and stuff going on at that time um, and of course we realized that that was the reason why she had that playing was because she uh, was probably trying to figure out a way to elude people that were chasing her and she went through one of Jean-Luc's uh, logs you know from all the years that she served with him and found that and figured that would be a good idea to do uh, with her ship is to hide it inside of a nebula because if the Borg had a hard time finding the Enterprise while it was in one then maybe the same thing would happen there. Uh, so that's <clears throat> that's why she they had that running. Makes sense. But it was also a, a little bit of a call back to that episode. Um, then there was a briefcase. I don't know if you remember it from the episode Family, uh, but Dr. Crusher was going through a, a uh, like a case, you know, a, a box or something like that, and it had all her husband's, her dead husband's belongings in it. Well, that case showed up in inside that ship she was in, uh, as they were going, as they were panning across, you could see that, that case, and it was, still had uh, his stuff, his name on the thing, so she took that with her. Um, and then there was a plaque uh, honoring her efforts 
in, in uh, saving uh, Cor Caroli V, and that, that place was mentioned in the Legions, uh, that episode where Picard's like stolen out of the, off the ship and he's transported to a room full of other people who were stolen from various places in the galaxy. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, remember, that there's that big one, that Chalnok there that was in there. Um, and Cor Caroli V was mentioned in that episode, so I guess that's where they, you know, they put that. So if you see that, there's a plaque, and I, you know, I, uh, I figured that plaque had something in it, and I had to uh, go back and rewind a little bit to uh, see it, you know, to see the, the lettering and stuff better on it. And I almost couldn't make it out, but I did see, I, it did sound familiar after I got the spelling. Uh, so that was here. And then, of course, the, uh, the Enterprise D painting we see in Picard's home that he wanted to give to Jordy. Uh, which we saw, I think we've seen it in the other seasons of Picard too, if I'm not mistaken. But he, he's had it uh, in his home on Earth. Uh, and uh, he, I don't know, remember, uh, they were packing stuff away. Of course, they showed all kinds of stuff in his house that we, we've seen. You know, like that, that, that flute that he had from Inner Light. We, I mean, we've, they've shown that a, a couple of times already on that. Um, so he had that in there too. And that, that artifact that Dr. Galen gave him uh, in that uh, episode, uh, The Chase, um, the one that you know op opened up and had all these little, little figurines inside of it, which we saw in Star Trek Generations that got smashed almost like <laughs> uh, he was picking it up in the ready room. Uh, you could see the, the lid of it. The rest of it might have been busted, I don't know, but uh, we saw that he, that he had that, okay? Um, and then, uh, when we go to Michelle Hurd, she's on a planet called Metallus, M apostrophe Talus. Well, obviously that's the last name of the director of the, of the show, Terry Metallus. So I guess they decided to name, name a planet after him or something in the show. <laughs> uh, and I don't know how many people saw this, but the Red Lady statue uh, that was in front of the Starfleet Recruitment Center uh, is actually the statue of Captain Rachel Garrett from the Enterprise C. Um, but they, they didn't show it very long on the screen, but you had to stop it because I knew it looked like somebody that I had seen on Star Trek. And they, of course, it went by so fast, I just rewinded it and stopped it right there. And I looked at that outline of the, of the figure and I said, wait a minute, I know who that is. That's Rachel Garrett. Uh, so. Yeah, that would, they threw that in there, but I think they threw it in there really good so that way people wouldn't catch it right off. But that's who it was. And one of the, the on the Titan, the destroyed shuttlecraft on the Titan uh, was named the Savick, okay, if you noticed. And Savick was also referenced as being the first captain of the original Titan. Uh, so I guess that's why they named a shuttlecraft uh, after her on the Titan. So it's because of her, you know, <clears throat> her history with that. Uh, seven and nine, you know, I, I think you all saw the model of Voyager in her room, but I thought, you know, just bringing that up. Of course, we see models of the Enterprise D uh, in that bar where, you know, we had these little tiny Enterprise D models, and somebody says, oh, I don't, nobody likes the fat one. They call the Enterprise D the fat one. <laughs> like, that's such a bad thing, right? You know, oh, nobody, you know, I always thought the Enterprise D looked kind of thin, because, you know, when you when you look at the star, uh, the star drive part of the Enterprise A, it's kind of fat, and, you know, or unrounded. But the Enterprise D one is kind of squat and and pushed out, you know. So I always thought the Enterprise D, especially with the saucer being squished down but longer, you know, that it was it wasn't a fat one. It was just a you know just a larger vessel, but it has a slimmer profile than the Enterprises A and B. Okay, so I, I don't know why they would say the fat one. <laughs> Maybe all the all the new starships in the Federation are just tiny, you know, except for the Enterprise F, and I can't remember what the classification that ship was. Anyway, that you know, there's all kinds of little models you see there, and I think that in the uh, briefing room of the Titan, there's some of his models in there on display that you can see. Um, 
and the music that Worf was playing while he was training with his batleth, uh, if you remember, it's the same music that Captain Picard was blaring in his radio room in Star Trek First Contact. Uh, the same, I can't remember the name of it, but it was the same same song, okay, uh, that he was playing. So maybe Worf is appreciating some human <laughs> yeah, music, you know, that's just as depressing as the shit he was playing all the time on you know, the Defiant, you know, on Deep Space Nine. Uh, and then the, the holodeck version of the 10 Ford Lounge had a neon sign in it, okay, and I don't know why that was incorporated in there because Guinan didn't have a neon sign uh, in her 10 Ford, but it's the same neon sign that they had in Star Trek 3 in that bar scene with McCoy trying to get a ride to Genesis, <laughs> okay? Um, and I, I'm guessing they prob that probably is the exact same sign. I don't think they went out and made it. I think they held on to it for years um, because I, I can't imagine that they went somewhere and had a whole new one made. You know, they have a place... Uh, at Paramount where they have a lot of the old Star Trek uh, things, props and stuff like that. I mean, I know they had an auction, but they didn't auction everything off, okay? I'm sure they auctioned a lot of stuff off, but I'm, there's things I'm sure they kept, okay? Um, and I think that neon sign was one of those things, and, uh, you know, it, it looked identical to that one that they had, so either they did make one, but I don't think they bother with it, or they just kept it for all these years, so maybe somebody had it hanging in an office somewhere, uh, <laughs> you know, because uh, it's small enough to be an ornament to put on somebody's wall, so I don't see why they'd want to get rid of it, so, you know, just for the fun of it. I wish I could at, uh, find out where they got the light bulbs for, because I got a, a thing like that, and I can't find a goddamn light bulb to replace it. I went, went to Lowe's, I went to HQ, and nobody even has one in stock, so I don't what the hell... Uh, Jesus. Then we see Odo's bucket. Okay, I'm surprised that, uh, you know, when they showed the bucket, they didn't really say much about what it's for. <laughs> you know, uh, but we all know what it's for because Odo had a bucket, and that was the one that they had in Tom on the Titan, uh, that they have to pour themselves into so they can relax uh, without spilling out all over the floor. <laughs> Uh, when they are basically just trying to recharge themselves or, you know, whatever it is. I don't know if they actually sleep in that thing, but they just kind of lay in there and just, you know, for how many hours just to kind of regenerate and then come out. All right, so I just, I think that uh, that was the same bucket. You know, of course, the lighting is so bad and dark on the show that you can't really uh, make out a lot of things. You know, it could have been the same bucket, but painted differently. I don't know. You'd have to look at that yourself and judge. Uh, but, like I said, lighting on those sets was terrible on the Titan. Um, and I just, I wish they never did that. You know, it would the episode would have been a lot better, I think, if we could actually see things a lot clearer, a lot brighter. Um, but it's too late now to go back and change that, I guess. Um, remember that Vulcan crime lord? Uh, which was really an oxymoron, but remember uh, <laughs> uh, when they showed him, uh, and he, he had on a, a, an Idic pendant, if you recall. That's the same pendant Spock was wearing uh, in that episode, uh, Is There in Truth No Beauty, in the original series. Um, it might have been the same one, or they probably just made another one that looked like it. Okay, I don't, you know, because if you go to any convention, Star Trek convention, you're probably going to find that pendant being sold somewhere, so it's probably they, maybe they just picked one up at a convention, and, you know, those pins are everywhere, uh, you have to go to, like, special online sites to find these, you know, like, Star Trek merchandise, and, and I'm sure you'll find it there, but they either had, either made, made one, but I try to doubt, or they just bought one at a convention or something, um, who knows, uh, then that mobile emitter that Worf was using to trick that Vulcan uh, is the same kind of mobile emitter that the Doctor was using on Voyager. So I guess, now everybody was saying, well, all that future technology that Voyager came back with was confiscated by Section 31. Well, that can't be the case. Because how did Worf have that mobile emitter? Okay. So I, that tells me that Starfleet took that mobile emitter and they started making copies of it, you know, 
Uh, and so mobile emitters are probably around in the, in the 25th century where they shouldn't be. Because I think that mobile emitter came from the 20, 29th century, was it? So it's, it's quite a bit, a, hundred, a few hundred years more into the future than, than, than where uh, the story here takes place. So, um, but if they're trying to save the timeline, they fucked up by, <laughs> by putting that out there uh, too soon. So you could, everything you saw about the time ship and all that stuff, that's, that story never happened now because now Starfleet has already begun using some of the technology that Voyager brought back uh, from the future or wherever the hell you know, they got it. And, uh, and so that timeline is now irreparably damaged, okay? Um, it's like what I was saying before about the discovery and everybody's saying oh the, you know I can't believe it's gonna you know Where the discovery ended up is an alternate future people okay from the point in time that they left And went into the future. That's the future that they Inevitably went into it's like an alternate reality uh, If they'd have left later Like ten years later the future they'd ended up in would have been different different still than the one they ended up in Okay? It all depends on what point in time you, you leap into the future, what the future might be. Okay, that's how, you, that's how you know that the future, well, they say it's not set in stone. It isn't. It can't be because certain events have to play themselves out in order for the, a future to cr be created. And since Discovery skipped all that, the future that they in, hit, uh, ended up in was random. So all that shit about the, the burn and all that stuff, that's just a possible future. That's not actually what what will happen. That's just a future that Discovery ended up in where the Federation had to go through that. That doesn't mean that's what's going to happen in the future, so whatever. <laughs> so that's why I say that the mobile emitter now changes uh, the, the future in some way because now the 25th century Star, uh, Starfleet has the mobile emitter and so it's not something new. <laughs> to the future and I, th I think everybody recognized Ro Laren's earring when she gave that to Picard and there was data inside that thing like a chip you know like a flash drive uh, of all the stuff that she compiled in her investigation into this big conspiracy going on inside Starfleet okay um, but uh, I recognized it right off so I figure if I did everybody else did especially people who like Ro Laren and Major Kira, uh, those earrings are pretty familiar. You know, they, they clip here and they clip there, you know, or something. And even the men wear them. Uh, it's a symbol, a uh, Bajoran symbol or something like that. I don't know if it represents a family or if it's just, I don't know, some religious icon that they wear. But uh, And, of course, the Daystrom station, uh, where there's a section 31 section <laughs> in the station. I don't know if it's the whole station or just part of it, but section 31 has a part in there. Uh, and just about everything you see in that station has something to do with some previous Star Trek episode or movie or something like that in there. So you really have to, you know, everything they're looking at, you got to look at it carefully. Um, I saw the Genesis device in there. I guess they're implying that Section 31 somehow managed to make one because the one that got used in Star Trek II was a prototype and not the, they didn't make any others. It was just that one, as far as we know, okay? And it was the prototype, the one they were actually gonna use on the moon, remember the, uh, where Kirk and the others ended up? Um, they were gonna use that moon to detonate the prototype on and see the result of it, okay? Uh, the one they, in the one that they used on the inside in the in the core of the moon was some smaller device okay just to make something out of the inside of the moon and then the second step would have been to do it on a larger scale uh, and so that's why regular one was orbiting that moon as they were fixing to use it on that moon to see if it would work um, so I don't know where they got another Genesis device unless they somehow got the, uh, the blueprints to it and built one. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it does go back to McCoy's argument about whose are the right hands uh, that can have one of those things. Because as we know, uh, Section 31 is, you know, not a very honest organization. They 
they like to do things behind the scenes so nobody knows what's going on. Uh, but it's like they're not much of a secret anymore. They haven't really been a secret since Star Trek Enterprise. I'm surprised that by the 24th century more people aren't aware of it. But, you know, uh, they've been around all the way back in that in those days and if Archer knew about it then you know Archer must have said something you know it should be common knowledge by the 24th century that oh yeah section 31 so I, I can't understand that episode where when they were talking about an organization section 31 and, and everyone's like oh I can't believe Starfleet has anything like that it's like come on guys they knew about this since Enterprise you know it's like, <laughs> you know how the hell can they not know so yeah section 31 um, and in the same scene they show a a corpse skeleton scan of james t kirk um apparently when they got the saucer section from you know that that crashed on viridian 3 uh they must have saw the grave site where james kirk was buried under a pile of rocks and they just took it uh, for whatever reason they don't even say they don't even elaborate but they took his corpse back to the station uh to try to clone them i don't know i i you know i just i think maybe they dumped that in there just for, for writers who want to spin off something from that you know what i'm saying i don't think they intend to actually do anything with it uh but i think they you know it's sort of like uh just to add a little more mystery to the section 31 you know atmosphere you know that they're up to something they're always up to something you know you never know what it is they're just they're always doing something okay uh and then, of course, that stupid attack trouble. That was the dumbest thing. I, I, I couldn't believe they did that. You know, it's like, why would you want to make a triple that bites, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or, or makes them hate Klingons even more. That doesn't even make any sense, okay? What are they planning on doing? Dumping a whole shitload of triples on, on the Klingon homeworld just to drive the Klingons nuts? I mean, come on. <laughs> what, what's that for? Uh, so, I don't know. Uh... <laughs> Maybe that's their version of a Death Star, you know, and, you know, beam, beam down a, whole, a, a few Tribbles and they'll multiply, and then before you know it, the whole world's infested with these killer Tribbles. Uh, and then, in that same park, they had this crow that was flying around. Now, right off the bat, I knew where they got that from, that episode Birthright, where Data was having that dream where he was a crow and all this, uh, remember? And uh, that obviously was reference to that episode there. Um, the scanner that Vatic was using to try to look for Jack Crusher, if you listen to the scanner, it sounds exactly like the one that Chekhov was using when they were on SETI uh, Alpha 5, when they were trying to find life form readings. Remember, they were on the, on the destroyed world, I guess, uh, in that desert, and you could hear doo -doo. Do -do -do -do. They also used it in Star Trek 3 when, when, uh, 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 David Marcus was looking for, uh, the life form reading, uh, around that photon tube where they shot, uh, Spock, uh, in, in uh, Star Trek 2. So that was the same sound effect they used for, for her, uh, for whatever she was using there to find Jack Crusher. Um, and then on the Titan monitor, they were showing a list of starships who were that were supposed to attend Frontier Day. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know they knew they were going to slip some names into there that uh, you were that would ring bells. And of course, they had the Excelsior listed there, and the Hikaru Sulu, and uh, the uh, uh, Douglas Drexter, who was the special effects person from Star Trek the motion picture and Denise Okuda you know you know they had all these familiar names in there uh, if you want to look at the list I'm sure there were more and I didn't see them all but it's just just to show you at that point you're gonna see a whole list of names that are gonna be familiar names um, and when you hear the SOS from uh, Anton Crusher I mean Anton Chekhov I'm sorry Anton Chekhov uh, it was voiced by Walter Koenig himself. Okay, he did the he did the actual messaging, and it sounded a little bit like the the SOS from the president in Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home. Uh, so I guess you could say they were kind of referencing back to that. Um, 
and of course Anton Chekhov. Anton was uh, the name of the actor from the Kelvin timeline in Star Trek. Uh, Anton Yelchin, who passed away, uh, you know, when he was young years ago, there uh, from he was doing something on his car, and a car fell on him or something and killed him. So, I, you know, I uh, that was a nice homage to him. Uh, and uh, so they, I guess they just took his first name and said, you know, this is a descendant of Pavel Chekhov. You know, we got Anton Chekhov. Um, and uh, so that was that was pretty neat. Um, then uh, Worf mentions the Mugatu meditation. <laughs> no, and Mugatu was that white ape-looking thing that we see in uh, TOS uh, in that episode, uh, A Private Little War. Um, and, you know, I was like, what kind of a meditation would be? I'm, I almost feel like Michael Dorn himself come up with that one because he, he said a lot of times he was a fan of the original Star Trek. And if that's true, then he must have you know, seen that episode a billion times so maybe that was his idea of putting that in the in there and not so much a line that somebody wrote but I think he did that himself he put that in there um, and then Data trying to finish that dumb linger like you know the was a young lady from Venus with a body shaped like it goes no you know and and the naked now uh, he tried that again, so obviously that was funny to hear him do that. Like, you know, finally we're going to hear the rest of it, and then everybody's like, shut up! You, know? <laughs> you don't want to hear it. Um, and then, of course, the way they ended the, the episode with the card game, and they panning back while they were above the table, and that was just like the way they ended it and all good things. Uh, so, uh, those were the kind of the things that I saw in there that, uh, you know, were possibly not as easy to remember, you know, if you, you know, if, uh, watching that go on, um, but, <clears throat> yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of Easter eggs in there, a lot, I mean, you could watch that, that whole season a number of times, and you'll probably see something you missed, um, in there, so if you didn't see some of these things I named off here, and maybe I, there's some that I didn't name off that you saw, uh, I'm sure that's going to be the case, uh, <laughs> uh, on both sides, but, yes, uh, compared to the previous two seasons of Picard, they didn't have a whole lot of Easter eggs in there. This one was Easter Egg City. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think, again, I feel like they did too much of that in there. Uh, because it just... For people who watch these things and they're like looking for that stuff, I mean, you're not paying attention to the story. And I think, you know, if you put too many Easter eggs into something and people are just looking at that... Uh, you know, you're not, they're not uh, really paying close enough attention to what's really going on. But I think they had too many things like that in there just to give us eye candy. Now, the whole thing with Moriarty, I'm sorry, but I thought it was going to be a, a much bigger part in the story. And it really wasn't. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry that, you know, that everybody thought that, oh my God, Moriarty must be behind the whole thing. Uh, that was that wasn't so much an Easter egg for the sh uh, for the show, but a mislead for the commercial of the season. Okay, they were throwing everything in the in this uh, commercials for this season in there, and they were throwing Moriarty and Vatic uh, in there, and you know they were just nobody could possibly guess what the season was really going to be about because everybody was was coming up with ideas, and I think that's the reason why they had. Uh, Moriarty in there was not so much to be a part of the story but to be part of the commercial for the story <laughs> you know the advertising just to throw off the fans okay I think that was the benefit of having him in, involved in that in some way but it wasn't really needed okay his part wasn't really needed in there it was just uh, you know a way to throw off the fans uh, from trying to figure out what the story was going to be about which nobody uh, would have ever guessed, um, but I, I mean, if you guessed something to do with the Borg, you would have been close, but a lot of people were saying, no, we already did the Borg in the first two seasons, so they ain't going to do it again in the third, and guess what? <laughs> um, so, uh, I would have liked to have seen, uh, you know, for an Easter egg or something in there, something, you know, like, like from the TNG era, 
you know, like maybe some of their weapons, you know, like when they were on the Enterprise D and they were going to the Borg Cube, I would have liked to have seen them bringing out some of their older weapons there, you know, like their phaser and the, and the tricorder, uh, you know, that they might have had still in, in the ship itself, you know, in the weapons locker, uh, because that is the original saucer, so I would assume that a lot of the things that were in there are still in there, you know, I mean, uh, maybe, the, you know, except for the people who took out their personal belongings, I think that things like, a, the, you know, the weapons lockers and stuff like that would have still had all the stuff in it, you know, um, but I don't know, it's just, I wish they'd have showed a little bit more of that, but, uh, but well, and, you know, now for, uh, <clears throat> I want to talk about Terry Metallus, uh, there's a lot of people out there, you know, speculating that, you know, because they're going, it seems like they're going to try to do a spinoff called Star Trek Legacy uh, that's going to center around the Enterprise G and Captain uh, Seven of Nine, a.k.a. Monica Hansen, um, which would be interesting. Uh, but I, you know, I, I don't know for sure if that's what they're going to do. And even when Paramount says they're going to do something, doesn't necessarily mean that's what they're going to do. Okay, they've done this many times before. They said, oh, we're going to do a Section 31 TV show, and, and that still hasn't happened. Oh, we're going to do a, a show about something else, and that never happened. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're very good at telling you what they want to do, but then all of a sudden, that project's gone. <laughs> okay, so don't take my word for it, but I read that somewhere online. So it's still a rumor, but it's not definite, okay, that they're going to do a Star Trek Legacy uh, thing like that. Um, of course, Alex Kurtzman would probably be responsible for any extra Star Trek stuff, you know, if it's made, um, which already deflates any positive, uh, opinion of what might come, okay, you know, if you had any hopes, your hopes will be shattered the minute you hear that name involved in it. Uh, but people are saying that he should, that Terry Metalla should be the one to head up all the future Star Trek projects that come their way. And I'm saying, well, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> Terry Metalis, yeah, he he did pretty good in displaying how much he knows about Star Trek The Next Generation and the Easter eggs are the proof of it. Uh, he remembers a lot of stuff about it, okay? And I could tell you right now, any Star Trek fan that I could pick up a phone and call uh, would be equally knowledgeable about TNG, okay? That really doesn't mean anything to me. If you put that, if that was an application, that wouldn't shock me because if you if you say that you were a fan of TNG and you made something like this, I would I would have expected no less, okay, from that person. He knows these characters well. Uh, he's watched these shows I know more than once, okay? He's younger than I am, so you know he probably didn't watch it when it originally aired, but. He, uh, he watched it growing up, and just like those of us that watched TOS, uh, we know the names of the episodes and the lines and the star dates and all the damn details that go <laughs> into that. And so it wouldn't surprise me that he would remember all these little tidbits of things that he saw on, on that show, okay? So if he was to write a Star Trek The Next Generation episode, okay, I would trust that it would be, you know pretty decent, okay? Uh, I'm not going to say that this story he wrote for Season 3 Picard was decent because it's not the typical style of storytelling that Star Trek is, you know, is accustomed to. We're, you know, we're used to these one hour a week episodes, okay, where this plot's laid out and they get to the fucking point and the story is, is done and there's maybe a lesson or something in here to reflect on and that's it, we move on to the next week and different story. That's the way Star Trek has always, or the way it should have been, it was the way it was for 40 years anyway, um, the style in which that was, those things were told. Um, but for somebody who watched TNG and they're asked to write a story that stretches out over a 10 hour period, that's going to be challenging even to, to some Star Trek fans. Uh, how are you going to tell a story that takes so long to tell? that, you know, you're used to watching in an hour, but this is going to have to last out into 10 parts, you know, you're going to fill up with a lot of things that are going to bore you, I think, in some way, uh, because unless this is a, I mean, if this, 
I mean, they had a lot of characters in this 10-hour season to, to cover because we have to catch up with everybody from TNG to find out where the hell and what the fuck they did in 20 years, okay, after the Nemesis. So, um, we, uh, we, we do that, and it, it takes a while. And that's why I said they spent too much time with Vatic, okay? Because Vatic, all that stuff with Vatic, didn't it happen before the group got together in the last half of the of the of the season. Okay, so Vatic was really uh, a side story that really you know didn't have to be told as long as it did. They could have done all the Vatic stuff in three, perhaps even four parts, and the rest of it could have been uh, what we saw in the last two parts of the season. They could have you know made that more expanded on that a lot more you know uh, so it felt rushed at the end of the season which unfortunately it shouldn't have been rushed it should have you know it should have taken its time but as it were as it was they had to they had to put in a lot of stuff okay and because they kept bringing in you know, like guest stars like Ro Laren and, and, and Shelby you know bringing in characters that we saw uh, they weren't just doing the main characters of TNG, but they were also bringing in, you know, a couple of other characters that were there. So they had to write backstories for them, you know, what they've been doing. <laughs> so, um, so it was really, there was really, uh, you know, a big story that covered a lot of characters. And, you know, they should have minimized how much time away from those characters that they, you know, didn't have to use, you know, just to... Uh, get these other characters, you know, tell their story and finish it and move on uh, to the main story, okay? And uh, I think that's where they went wrong with it. But when they did the final two, three parts of the season, uh, that's when the story began to shine because then that's where they were really getting down to the nitty gritty of, the, of it and getting to the, you know, solving the problem, the climax of the story. Um, and that's where you see uh, Terry Metalis sort of shine uh, in this because, as, <clears throat> like I said, he knows his characters and he knows TNG. Uh, my problem was that, in like a lot of Next Generation episodes in the series, uh, there was always a point to the story, okay? There was supposed to be a point to the story this season here about family because it, obviously it's, it's reeked of family, you know, from start to finish. Um, and there had to be a bottom line, you know, to this to this story. And they just simply kind of overlooked it or they just never addressed it at the end, okay? It was just simply, it was played out like just an adventure story, but it didn't have any big meaning or anything like that in there. I, I would challenge anyone to watch it and come up with something uh, that it might have said, like this episode might have, might have said here in season three. What do they think the message was uh, in season three, Picard? Uh, because if there was one, um, I I don't know if you could really say for sure what it was because there was so much um, coming and going <laughs> in the season that you really uh, really couldn't formulate an opinion about anything. I mean, there might have been a lot of different. A lot of different messages being sent in there but uh, usually a story would have you know this one big message to the to the Star Trek fans here uh, at the end and, and unfortunately I didn't see it okay um, uh, there's sim certainly a lot of dra uh, drama and emotional moments in in the in the season you might be able to get something out of that but uh, as far as for the whole thing I don't know and uh, <sighs> I think that was the one thing that was missing that Terry Metalis didn't put into the story. Um, but as you know, as a director, um, for everything else, you know, he did good. He directed good on it. But I think the story was just sort of sluggish and it held him back. I think. Um, but could he do Star Trek? Let's say put him on Strange New Worlds. Could he do? Uh, episodes of Strange New Worlds. Okay, well, if he understands the formula of Star Trek but wasn't able to really execute it in Season 3 Picard, 
he might be able to do well, but he doesn't know these characters on Strange New Worlds. These are totally different characters. Um, he might know Spock, okay? He might know Spock, uh, but number one and uh, some of these other characters, uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, he'd have to basically kind of relearn uh, these characters from scratch. I mean, I don't know if he could actually do it. Uh, because it's different when you're when you're writing something of, of a new Star Trek. Like, you know, there's a lot of people out there that like to, to script their own kind of Star Trek story. Okay, and you see, if you go to the book, any bookstore in America, you'll probably see a, a shelf full of Star Trek novels. And some of them Star Trek novels are part of a series of novels. And you'll see that if you read any of them, and I've read some of them, okay, um, they're not so they're not so clearly defined characters because they've never seen these people or these characters on TV um, and so they are at the task of having to create characters that are basically unknown to them uh, or based on characters that they've seen on other TV shows or people they've met in their life and trying to make them as interesting as say Captain Kirk or Jean-Luc Picard or Cisco or Janeway or you know all these other characters. I mean, how can they do that? I mean if they if If they try to do something like that is Terry Metalis capable of creating a whole new Star Trek I mean if they if they say look we're gonna have you helm Star Trek legacy You're gonna do all these stories. Well, he might know seven of nine. He might understand seven of nine But what about the all the other characters that are that were first times even to us? Okay, we don't even know these characters still, even though we've seen them on season three Picard. They didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, fleshing these characters out. He would have to be responsible for doing that, and would he be able to do it? It's one thing to write about something you know. It's a whole different thing to write about something you hardly know and try to make it as interesting as something you knew. That's the, that's the thing. So I would say, should he do it? Well, he can't go any worse than Alex Kurtzman. Okay, I think that <laughs> they need a they need a fresh idea, they need a fresh face, or you know, some fresh ideas. So why not try him out, just for the hell of it? See see if he can. Uh, but don't expect big things. Okay, expect it to happen slowly if he does, because he's going to he's going to have some difficulty trying to figure out these characters on his own if they bring him into the into any more Star Trek projects. I don't know. That all depends. That's all paramount politics, you know, what's going to happen in the interim. Um, and like I said, uh, Star Trek Legacy may not even happen, okay? Uh, but just the idea that uh, people are talking about it, um, I just felt like I should add my two cents into that and say that, you know, hey, you know, uh, it can't do any worse than Alex Kurtzman has done over the years, okay? And I figure... Uh, I mean, Alex Kurtzman said he was a Star Trek fan. I don't believe that. I think he maybe watched a few episodes of it, and that was it. But this guy here uh, obviously knows TNG well, okay? And he may know Deep Space Nine and Voyager. I don't know. But that was his favorite. TNG was his favorite. So he at least he knows that. And in, in this season of Picard uh, showed it, okay? So I say give him a chance see what happens. That's what I say to that. Give him a chance to see what happens. <laughs> okay, so in this final, final segment here, uh, I'm going to shoot out an overall score uh, of all three seasons of Star Trek Picard, okay? Um, and it's taking in a lot. As you know, <laughs> Uh, I wasn't too impressed with those first two seasons, as a lot of people uh, were. They were in agreement with me. Um, there were some people that disagreed with me on that, and that's okay. But, you know, uh, from their point of view, they liked it, okay? And so, but what I'm doing is I'm going by my personal opinion. I'm not going to take anybody else's opinion into account for what I think. Uh, but those first two seasons were very, very poorly written. Uh, even though they may have been well acted, uh, the stories were really not that, you know, coherent for the most part. They just seemed to flounder and 
dance all over the map, and you know, it just didn't seem like it had any direction. Like the, well, as they were riding it, somebody would say, "Move over, I'm gonna finish," you know, and it was like 50 different riders trying to contribute stuff to one story. You know, <laughs> that's what it felt like all the time. So, um, so the first two, each one, I probably give maybe a star and a half. Okay, uh, for you know, a star and a half for the first season, and a star and a half for the second. I know that sounds kind of harsh, but that's kind of how I felt about it. And, you know, I've seen Godzilla movies that were, you know, better than that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I just, I feel like, uh, you know, if I can sit and watch, you know, uh, something like, like a Godzilla movie and be more entertained with it than I can watching a season of Picard, then that's pretty bad, okay? That's pretty bad. I really don't want to see those first two seasons of Picard ever, 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 ever again, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I just, I don't want any association with that at all. To me, I just would assume that never even happened. <laughs> um, so, a star and a half for those first two. Uh, for season three, I'm going to give it, uh, I'm going to give it, uh, close to three stars maybe more than two and a half a little less than three but it was it was better it was better but because like I said it was so slow at the beginning in those first seven parts I was like you know Jesus you know Vatic 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 and it wasn't going anywhere <laughs> you know at the beginning uh, and because the show was a bottle show which means it was all filmed on sets it made this the story even you know feel you know uh, claustrophobic in a way uh, and I hate episodes that are filmed in that fashion because it's dark and you're in set after set and you feel like you can't get any fresh of breath you know a breath of fresh air it's just you're confined in the story and when it lasts as long as that did by the time it's over you know you feel like you've you've been you've been uh, in your bedroom for two three days straight and you know <laughs> um, so yeah, it did not feel like it was very fun to, to, to experience because it was so confined in different sets. And I, uh, you know, I miss the away missions and all these other things, you know, um, but no matter where they went, they were on a set. <laughs> so they spent a great deal of money, I guess, on sets, especially when they had to build the D bridge. Um, they, they spent a lot of money on sets. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, could there have been any locations they could have used uh, for things like maybe the Section 31? They probably could have went to a location somewhere that wasn't a set to film that. It didn't necessarily have to be in a set because it really felt small and confined, you know, and just felt like, you know, you know, the walls are closed in all around you, you know, and I just felt like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, it's bad enough that the sets were dark, but to give you the feeling that you're shut inside of a closet through the whole thing, it's like, no. Uh, it just, it felt very kind of moody and depressing, and I just, I didn't like the, the style of, the, of that in, in, the, in the season. That's what really drops a lot of the stars out of that. Now, the only reason why I give it you know, as high as I did is the last couple of chapters in the story. When we finally get to see the D and then the story picks up, then it starts to feel better, you know, the bridge is well lit, it's open, you know, you feel like you're the, you know, the wind is, the air is coming in, you know, then it started to feel better, okay, at that point. But before that, ugh, you know, I, I almost would, would probably never watch, you know, much of that season again except for the final two parts, if I was to rewatch any of it, okay? But, <laughs> uh, again, the whole the whole enterprise of Picard, Star Trek Picard, was really a failure. Um, and it's, it's sad because... Um, it could have been so much more than just that. Because this, I felt this was a chance. And I know I've said it before. This was a chance where they could have taken all, all the different spin-offs of TNG, like Deep Space Nine and Voyager, where they could have brought those two series into combination with TNG and had a big 
final story that wrapped up all of it to give you sort of an explanation as to why we had to see Deep Space Nine and Voyager because at the end all these shoals are going to matter in one big story at the end that's going to culminate into something that's really going to be awesome where all of it, everybody's involved, okay? And that would have been, to me, a good way of not just bringing closure to TNG, but to that whole that whole era, basically. Because those three shows took place in the 24th century. You know, uh, Enterprise took place 100 years before that, so you wouldn't have to put that in there. Um, but to have those three shows together having this one mission that involves all of them, Okay, and it could have been about Cisco, you know, or something like some big thing about the Bajoran, you know, could have been something like that. Or, you know, the Dominion War or whatever, something like that. But anything but the Borg. But they should have had something that wrapped up the whole, that whole generation, basically. Because really, that the next generation wasn't just TNG, it was Voyager, it was Deep Space Nine. So, having all three of those shows come together for one big episode at the end that last takes 10 parts seems would seem to me to be a logical thing but then of course uh, they would have had to find a way to make it sort of relevant to Picard since the show was called Star Trek Picard so he would have to be the focal point which I guess would make sense since TNG was the first and then you know Deep Space Nine these other shows were like additions to what we were being uh, introduced to a TNG and the families they're all linked because you know Barkley showed up on Voyager a number of times and Marina Sirtis was in some episodes with him so there's a link right to TNG uh, right there right and then you have the link to TNG with Worf okay and there was an episode where uh, I think it was on TNG where they visited Deep Space Nine uh, and Worf is looking for uh, what was it? His, uh, a Klingon that was a prisoner or something like that, and he got um, an, a, a tip from an uh, Iridian or something. But it took place on Deep Space Nine for a part of it anyway. So, you know, you got links to Deep Space Nine in the next generation, right? So, this that already linked all those together right from the get go. So, at the end, you would have had this big thing, you know, where they all three shows you could have had Voyager and Deep Space Nine. Uh, with the uh, with the Enterprise uh, D or something, it, it could have been a big big closure for that uh, as we move into the 25th century now. Because you know Picard was only what in the beginning of the 25th century, like 2401 or something like that. Um, so you know this would have been a, a good send off for any future Star Trek shows opening up the 25th century. So I thought, you know, that would have been a much better way, I think, because then it would have forced them to come up with a story that's not just going to be a play on the board, but it's going to have to involve each of those shows in some way that's relevant to them as well as the next generation. So that would have forced them to go back into the library of Star Trek shows and try to find something in there that would have had to bring everybody back uh, to do something that would have brought back O'Brien, that would have brought back... Uh, Keiko, maybe, as much as I'd hate to think that, but <laughs> um, it would have brought back Dr. Bashir, it would have brought back uh, Chakotay, it would have been brought back to, uh, Paris and the, the Doctor. You know, it could have brought back so many more characters to finish off the the rest of what was left hanging there for the 24th century. So that's what I was hoping that it would be. Um, but overall, the, the whole bunch of those things, uh, this Picard seasons one, two, and three, uh, I would just give it all just three stars, you know, all together, three stars all together. And like I said, that's that's not a very good score for all the money they spent, all the time they spent, all you know. Uh, and I wish I could have given it more because I have a lot more respect for uh, the next generation and the and the characters on there than 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 I did with Discovery. For you know, for Christ's sake, I mean, it just. Um, and I, want, I would have liked to have given them more, but it's just, it's the people behind the scenes that fucked it all up. It really was from the get-go. Um, and if Terry Metalis didn't show up in that, I don't, I don't think they would have felt that their uh, work would have been, uh, would have been worth it. 
if he didn't show up and try to do something to put a bow on all of this. Um, I still say that Paramount probably looked at this as a loss uh, and that they didn't get back the money they really put in. I don't know, but I can't see that they did because they lost subscribers during this period um, and a lot of people will never go back to watching Star Trek stuff ever again because the people that used to do it are gone or they're just not involved anymore. <laughs> So a lot of people have already said that once this is this is over, uh, they're not watching it anymore. That's it. They don't want to even watch Strange New Worlds. They don't want nothing to do with anything Star Trek anymore now. So uh, I think the damage is is pretty done. It's 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 pretty bad, and you know it's sad that a, a good famous franchise as Star Trek uh, was um, is probably just going to phase out into basically just a footnote <laughs> in Hollywood history. You know. Um, but it still has a lot of good history. Um, you've got a lot of good TV shows that were made uh, in, the, in its time. Um, and it's uh, uh, really worth watching for those people who never get to see Star Trek. You know, they could watch, they could watch those older shows and appreciate that. Because um, again, you know, they got, there's always something to learn, you know. And what was messaged then it still applies to today. You know, it just it speaks to the future as well. Um, so, you know, even though they can't really do it anymore like they did, um, the stuff, the there's a lot of body of work out there that can really keep you going for it, you know. And who knows, maybe someday uh, they'll come back and it'll they'll make it just like it was. I mean, maybe it takes maybe it takes a generation to absorb it. <laughs> You know, and finally figure out what Gene Roddenberry's uh, method was that made it so good. Uh, maybe they'll figure out finally how to do a, a, a proper Star Trek show. I mean, Doctor Who was going through the same thing. You know, that that's another big franchise that was so popular, but it's going through the same problem right now, uh, where they got different people trying to do Doctor Who, and nobody seems to know how to do it right, and the fans are getting pissed, and they just you know they're leaving the franchise. You know. I guess it, it happens when when creators of things pass away uh, and they try to hand it down to somebody who understands them after a while it starts to get thinner and thinner you know until there really is no creative talent anymore okay and I think that's what's happened is over the years after uh, Roddenberry passed away Star Trek was just kind of uh, getting weaker and weaker uh, uh, over time uh, and Star Trek Enterprise was, I think, was the was one of those was like where the will a straw broke the camel's back and all. Uh, and I think what they did is they went to the well too many times over the years to do Star Trek. They they just they bored us to death with it, and they became very repetitive with stories. And they just uh, people could see through it because the fans you can't pull the wool over the fans' eyes. They see everything. That's what they don't understand is people who watch this shit day and day and day, at, you know, after a friggin' day. These people are, they like program themselves on how to do Star Trek on their own, okay? And the, and the proof is go on YouTube and look up, look up Star Trek fandom uh, sh uh, shows on there, okay? Look at what other fans are making for Star Trek. It's far superior to, to anything that Paramount has been making in the last 10 years, folks. I'm sorry to say, even with the little budgets that they have, and they make these 15-minute episodes, which they're allowed, you know, to do. Uh, then you're going to see some real Star Trek being made by by a lot of good uh, uh, fans who seem to understand it a lot better than Paramount. And that's what scares Paramount the most. That's why they went through that whole thing about, you know, putting limits on what they can do on YouTube. Because it scared the shit out of them. When they saw what these people were making, they, they just, no, 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 no. We're not going to have competition with YouTube, you know. But, hey, you know, if they don't want to make money with the franchise, then why don't they just shut it down? I mean, Christ, it's better than just killing it. You know, shut it down. You know, that's my opinion. You guys don't, if you can't do Star Trek, then don't do it at all. Just stop what you're doing and quit, okay? And hire these damn people on Facebook, I mean, on, on YouTube, rather, who've been doing this stuff. Ask them to come on. Hire them to do your fucking Star Trek and have them make the stuff. Okay, if you give these people a fucking budget, they can do Star Trek 50 times better than any one of you guys out there can. You know, 
Well, that's that's that little city uh, series. What was it like? In eight, eight or nine parts. Star Trek continues or something. Um, they did pretty well with that. They have episodes which, in my mind, in my can in my mind's canon, finishes the the five year mission. Okay, because in their last episode they they connected it right to the Star Trek the motion picture era. And so in my mind, they actually finished it for us because all these years we never got to see the whole five year mission because CBS, you know, decided to or you know, uh, can it or NBC, whichever the channel was, I can't remember, but they canceled it because they weren't getting enough viewers. Of course, it would have been enough viewers today if they'd have done it, because back in them days, they had higher demands on who could, how many people needed to be watching a show. Today, you know, if you get 10 people to watch a show, they think, oh, we got high ratings. Well, it would have been canceled back in the 80s, <laughs> dang bad, if they couldn't get uh, more than, you know, five or six million viewers every night, you know, watch <laughs> okay? Uh, but it was different times. But today, None of the Star Treks they're making on Paramount today would have lasted at all back in the 80s. Every damn one of them would have been canceled because of the, the viewer rates that, they were, that they've been getting. That's not enough. It wouldn't have been enough to keep that, that show going. They'd have had to, they would have demanded much better uh, from them uh, than, than they've been making. And, you know, that's, that's, how, I, that's how I can tell you how, why these shows aren't good because I grew up like a lot of people my generation grew up during a time when television shows had to be in entertaining and they can't they had to appeal to a family okay you had a lot of great tv shows back in the uh, 60s 70s and 80s because there were only like three major networks and so in order to get uh the proper number of viewers you had to have viewers in the millions okay uh in order to main, to keep a show on the air, you couldn't get away with just having you know what fifty thousand people watching a show every week or something. That would never have flown back then. Uh uh. <laughs> if that's all they could get for a whole season, they would have they would have axed it way before the season ended. They would have axed it. They weren't going to spend a dime more on that. So, like I said, these are different times. Anything flies now on television. You look at the CW or look at the shows they're making on these streaming services. All crap. You know? These things, don't, they don't last. Why do you think Netflix is always canceling shows all the time? It's because they can't get anybody to watch their stuff. You know? They can't get enough viewers for the money they spend. And they're always making new shows and they're always canceling the new shows they just start. <laughs> you know, the same thing is happening in all these other shows too. So this season of Picard, uh, it probably got more viewers than the other two seasons, uh, but it still wouldn't have been enough back in the in the days I grew up in to keep something like that on the air. Okay, that would have been that season would have been considered a failure because it was so long and, and dragged out and everything. Uh, it wouldn't have lasted. So anyway, that's it. I think that covers pretty much everything I wanted to say. Uh, about this season of Picard um, and uh, I don't know how you felt about it uh, I hope that uh, uh, you guys can you know throw me some uh, feedback your way about you know how you thought of it overall uh, and you know maybe open some discussion there on that um, but I, I really I, like I said this is pretty much you know like I said I tried to do this originally and I found out the longer the video went the more stuff I kept coming up to mind that I wanted to say and that's why I had to make this into th into three parts <laughs> okay um, so anyway uh, I hope everybody has uh, a great rest of the week so please uh, take care and subscribe and comment and uh, this could be the last episode of this season of Trekker Critique, uh, so I will probably uh, be starting a new season, I don't know when, but uh, I need to have some material uh, to be able to start one because it's, uh, you know, getting difficult to find anything good to talk about uh, with science fiction these days, so, <laughs> um, so anyway, um, take care everybody, and live long and prosper, and I'll see you later.